Hi friends! Today I'm reading The Youngest Marcher by Cynthia Levinson. Whenever Mike flew into town, Audrey and her mama cooked barbecue ribs, stewed greens, sweet potato souffle, and Audrey's favorite, hot rolls baptized in butter. Other folks knew Mike as Martin or Dr. King. The Hendrixes used his nickname. They did the same with other ministers too, like Fred Shuttlesworth and Jim Bevel. After Mike blessed the feast, Mama expected Audrey to keep still during supper. But when grown-ups talked about the wiping out of segregation laws that kept black and white people apart in Birmingham, she just had to speak up. Audrey intended to go places and do things like anybody else. I want to eat my ice cream inside Newberries. I want to sit downstairs at the Alabama. I don't want hand-me-down school books. But stools at the counter, plush movie theater seats, books so fresh they, they crackle when you open them, those were for white children. Hush, hissed Mama. Nine-year-old children should not speak in front of company, especially ministers like Mike, Fred, and Jim, who are bringing dreams of justice. Audrey knew all about segregation. She knew to pay the driver at the front of the bus, then step off and walk around the back to the back door. Drink from the fountain with the dirty bowl and the warm water. Use the freight elevator at the department stores downtown. Front, front row seats, cool water, elevators with white gloved operators. Law said those were for white folks. Every Monday night, Audrey and her mama and daddy and her aunts, uncles, and cousins joined neighbors and friends at Fred's church for worship, fellowship, and testimony. She sang and swayed along with the movement choir, her voice spirited and spiritual. Black and white together, we shall overcome. For once, she didn't have to sit still. Then came testimonies. White sto store owners won't hire me. Ku Kluxers chased me. Policemen called me names. The hateful stories made Audrey squirm. She tried to tell her mama, that's not right. Shh. How could mama expect her to hush? She had to make things right. But what could she do? When Mike visited Fred's church, Thousands of people crowded around, around her to hear him preach, and a voice so taut as steel cables, as smooth as glass, he intoned, Segregation is morally wrong and sinful. That's true. Fired up, Audrey sat taller. An unjust law is no law at all, he proclaimed. Audrey had listened to Mike explain his plan at her supper table and knew what he meant. If a law is unjust, disobey it. Sit down inside Newberries. Pick at those white stores. March to protest those unfair laws. Why, even marching was against the law. Then, get arrested. Fill the jails, Mike exclaimed. Fill Birmingham's jails so full that policemen can't squeeze in one more person. Pack cells so tight that police will have to quit arresting people for demanding their rights. Audrey just knew Mike's plan would work. She twisted in her pew to see which grown-ups would walk down the aisle, volunteer for jail. But they mostly stayed put. Her, they mostly stayed put, eyes staring at their feet, hands on their knees, Feet, hands, and knees didn't move. Fill the jails, Mike pleaded, meeting after meeting. But head shook all around her. Audrey heard, no, best not break those segregation laws. 
Boss man will fire me. Landlord will evict me. Policeman will beat me. If nobody protested, Mike's plan would fail. Police would keep arresting anyone, anytime, for anything, forever. Audrey, nev Audrey would never be able to go places and do things like everybody else. One night, Jim announced a new idea. If grown-ups won't do it, fill the jails with children. Audrey leaped to her feet. I want to go to jail, she declared. Mama looked deep and saw that Audrey's eyes begged. Please? Okay, Mama said. Audrey strutted down the aisle. She was going to jail. Two mornings, two mornings later, she put on a fresh pressed pinafore and a shiny and shiny Mary Jane's with turned down socks. Protesters got to look nice. In the meantime, her daddy brought her a game to help her pass the time in jail. Her mama and daddy took her by the Center Street Elementary to tell her teachers she'd be absent, maybe for a whole week. Miss Wills wrapped her arms around her. Audrey knew she was proud of her. She said goodbye to her grandparents. You'll be fine, her grandmother said. She knew Audrey would be brave. So did Audrey. Then her mama and daddy drove her to the 16th Street Baptist Church, where the children were gathering. Even before she reached the door, Audrey heard loud voices chanting freedom songs. Inside, hundreds of big kids called out to their friends and crowded around signs for their high school. Parker, Carver, her head swiveled. Where was the sign for Center Street Elementary? She was the only protester from her school, the youngest child in the whole church, and she knew no one. Audrey huddled by her parents in the basement, but when Jim lined her up with the others, two by two, and the door swung open, Audrey straightened up. She was going to break a law and go to jail to help make things right. Clutching a protest sign in one hand and her game in the other, Audrey marched out the door. She stomped and sang, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Half a block from the church, a white policeman stopped Audrey. He pointed towards a police van. Sentence, one week in juvenile jail. A matron locked Audrey into a day room with two dozen other girls, all older, all bigger, all strangers. Audrey sat down alone and stripped the cover off her game. I told you to sit down, the matron yelled. Audrey jumped. She didn't remember standing. The matron dragged her to a dark, empty room. When I tell you to do something, you do it, she commanded, or I'll leave you here. Trembling, Audrey quietly followed the matron back to the day room, put, her, put away her game, and lie down, on, lie down her head and cried. Jail was harder than she thought, and she wasn't fine after all. By evening, Audrey was hungry and tired. For dinner, soupy, oily, tasteless grits. At night, a bare mattress with one thin sheet for a cover. Next morning, uh-oh, no fresh underwear, no clean pinafore, no toothbrush. Audrey and her cellmates were let outdoors into an empty concrete pen surrounded by high prison walls. The older girls talked together. Audrey wondered what her classmates were doing. Miss Willis, Miss Wills would be keeping them busy.
On another day, Audrey was sent into a huge room and told to sit down in a chair that was so high, her feet dangled above the floor. Four white men glared at her. She'd never talked to a white man before. Are you against America? One demanded to know. No, sir, she answered politely. What do you talk about at those meetings? Another asked. Our freedom. Why did you march? To go places and do things like anybody else. What was wrong with that? Every meal time, Audrey stared at greasy grits. She could barely spoon them into her mouth, let alone swallow them. Every night, the cot's wire springs jabbed. Every morning, she had nothing to do but sit alone with her game. In the afternoons, though more kids crowded into the day room, some days, many of them arrived sopping wet. A girl explained that a fireman aimed a powerful hose at those children. Surging water spun them off their feet and down the street. They got up and kept marching anyway until they, were, they too were sent to jail. By Audrey's fifth day in detention, the police couldn't squeeze one more person in. We filled up all the rooms. We filled up all the rooms. Audrey practically jumped up and down. She was so proud. We filled up all the rooms. Watching television in the day room, she saw black people stroll straight into stores and restaurants like they belonged there. No one else could be sent to jail. Everything had changed. After seven days, Audrey went home. Her mama and daddy wrapped their arms tight around her, washed the jail off her, and for dinner, hot rolls, baptized in butter. Two months later, the city of Birmingham wiped segregation laws clean off the books. Audrey licked her spoon clean at Newberry's counter, like everybody else, black and white together, like we belong.